Uh, good morning and welcome both here in the room and following the event online via the Scottish Parliament's Facebook page to our event, Climate Change in Scotland 2050 Visions. It's uh, great to be able to use technology to be able to bring this debate on climate change to a wider audience than that able to attend in person. Uh, this event is to mark Climate Week, a week for Scottish organisations to raise awareness of and inspire action on climate change. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by three Scottish creative thinkers who will take us through their visions of Scotland in 2050 from a climate change perspective, providing a different take on the debate compared to the usual voices. Uh, once the three speakers are finished, we'll have a short time for questions from the audience, so please store up your questions for that point. We'll also take questions via the Twitter feed. Please tweet us at Scottish, Scott Parrell using the hashtag ScottClimateQs. So let me introduce our panel. Firstly, I have uh, Mandy Haggith, who lives in a coastal wooded croft in Assent in the North West Highlands and works as a freelance writer and researcher. She's been awarded two Scottish Art Council Writers Bursaries and a Creative Scotland Artist Award and has won and been shorted for several poetry competitions. In the summer of 2013, she was the poet in residence in the Royal Botanic Gardens and I hope she's going to bring together her creative work, writing skills and her vision for 2050. Our second speaker uh, resides a little closer to here. He currently works at Edinburgh University teaching and carrying out research in the areas of Christian ethics, ecology and religious ethics and economy and ethics. He's published 12 books and over 70 academic papers and has a keen interest in the ethics of climate justice, Professor Michael Northcott. And our final speaker will be from Scotland's 2050 Climate Group, uh, Scotland's Youth Climate Group, um, which is a collection of young professionals across the country who all share a commitment to climate change mitigation and adaptation and accelerating Scotland's transition to a low carbon economy. Sarah Knight has recently graduated with an MSc in Ecological Economics from the University of Edinburgh. She's currently working as a research analyst for an environmental consultancy, working on a project to raise uh, environmental awareness within the oil and gas sector. So welcome to you all. And can I ask you, Mandy, to begin? Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you all very much for coming so early in the morning. Um, I'm going to read you a few poems, um, starting with the very, very big and moving to the very small of climate change. Um, and I want to begin by reflecting on the fact that the climate has been changing since the Earth was created and um, is in flux, um, and that um, but that, of course, the, the um, impacts of humans are changing the nature of that change. Um, and, um, and I'm going to begin by asking you to imagine um, the end of the last ice age. Um, and for me, an interesting th thought is the fact that when the climate does change, as we can look at the pa patterns from geology, sometimes it changes very rapidly indeed. And perhaps the impacts of um, our unprecedented um, change in CO2 levels might also trigger very, very rapid changes of this sort. Imagine. Imagine the land covered in ice, almost to the top of the mountains. Imagine the peaks of Kunyag, islands of rock in a sea of ice. Imagine it sparkling under stars, freezing in the night cold, crackling into crispness. Imagine the moon in a blue sky, looking down on all that white. Imagine it thawing by morning, south faces softening. Imagine the sun burning through fog, melting its edges, weakening its hold on the land. Imagine warm wind gnawing at westerly slopes, corroding crystals. Imagine trickles of melting, a gurgle of bubbles in cracks, an insistent rub of fluid, widening slivers of sliding, slumping slush. Imagine the collapse, an afternoon thunder of mountainside ice slides, a roar as trickles merge into torrents. Imagine the ice in motion, seething down to the coast, dragged west by gravity to the Atlantic Ocean. Imagine how it would ground and scour, groan and crack. Imagine stones grabbed from crags and grasped from corners, loosened, freed, tumbling, snatched back by earth in erratic ways and places. Imagine water working its way under, lubricating the lower surface, loosening its grip, sending it slipping along. Imagine it carving, icebergs teetering off into ocean journeys, glacial offspring doomed to a life of seamelt. Imagine great chunks of chill swept into the heaving sea. 
Imagine it wasting away, watering down, sweating and winnowing, drifting into wet breath. Imagine the smell of drying ground. Imagining, imagine the first signs of life, green moulds, algal scum, filaments of moss, a frond of lichen. Imagine the first wind-blown grass seed germinating in that spring of springs. Imagine the first bird. What I hope doesn't happen as a result of climate change is that we lose these guys, polar bear. Low angled sun gleams through claret leaves and caribou lichens pale green in the first skiff of snow. A frozen hare watches the flight of a falcon and spruce fingers point where the winds will blow. Tamarack needles flutter and flurries of snow buntings dart over flaming jade, bronze and copper-leaved willow. Photographers get set to lie, to freeze-frame your world, starched, ice-bleached Arctic, whitewashing your rainbow. Here you lie in the forest, a snoozing sumo wrestler under trees barely able to hold up the sky, so heavy with snow. That was the polar bear I saw in the woods and I'm um, kind of worried that there might be less and less of the ice for the polar bears to live on. I'm very motivated by forests. I work a lot on forests and um, I think one of the issues that we really need to not forget about in the climate change um, debate is the massive importance of forests as carbon sinks um, globally and, and the ability that we have and the responsibility we have in this country to um, restore forests as much as possible to um, sequester carbon. Um, but it's actually, we need to remember that about 90% of all the forest products that we use in this country are coming from other people's forests. A rustle of leaves, good books and toilet rolls felling ancient trees. Um, I'll read you another forest poem just to um, remind us of that. Some are dark hearts full of secrets of enslavement, some dry and dangerous, some alternately fly infested and freezing, some damp and frail, but all spirit rich, homes to folk with leaves in their eyes and mushrooms in their pockets, who dream of chasing animals among branching shadows, for whom the future is a tree root that presses open rocks of the past, with whom all stems intertwine, in whom all saps and bloods and rivers mingle, under whose power a single bud becomes an eye, a wing, a soul, becomes the whole breathing planet. And I'll finish with one thought, which is probably no matter what happens, we'll still have these guys, midges. <laughs> A column of dancing midges whines like a single mosquito. Looking up, each swarm member is bodiless movement, etch-a-sketching on the sky. Two land stand, one little twelve-legged trestle table. We know so little of the world, its grey smudges, its inscrutable stillness. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, can I now invite Professor Michael Northcott to make a contribution? Thanks very much again. It's great to have so many people here this early in the morning on such an uh, inspiring topic. Because thinking about the future in, in hopeful ways, I think, is potentially very inspiring. And I think one of the things we need in the climate change debate is visions of how doing the right thing by Mother Earth will also be um, good for us as a species and the species we share our country with. So my first sense when I think about Scotland 2050 is, is a hopeful one. Um, Scotland committed itself to an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in this parliament uh, in the 2010 Climate Change Act 
we, we are on target to uh, deliver the uh, intended emissions reductions by 2020, not least because of Scotland's success in um, capturing wind uh, into the national grid. Um, I use on my little phone here an app from NOAA, um, not um, NOAA in the Bible, I'm a professor of religion and ethics, but um, NOAA is the North American Organize, uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And they have a particularly wonderful app which can show you uh, wind, rain, storms, hurricanes, whatever's coming at you. And if you look at it every day, it's quite evident that Scotland is one of the windiest places on Earth. And this particular capital is the windiest capital on Earth uh, of any nation. Um, so it's a huge resource for us. We have great potential as a nation uh, in renewable power. Um, and it's one of my great regrets that the English government under David Cameron made the really extraordinary decision to um, limit the capacity of Scotland to add further onshore wind power to the national grid and to the UK's uh, targets on greenhouse gas emissions. Because, of course, uh, wind is our most uh, uh, valuable and uh, economically um, viable form of indigenous power. There may be a bit of gas we can frack from under the ground, though I'm opposed to fracking myself. But we're an incredibly crowded island, 65 million people, most of them crammed into the space below um, the Tweed and um, the Solway Firth. And if we start fracking in areas where people live so intensely, the dangers of and risk to water pollution are extremely uh, significant. So my feeling is that um, uh, wind is very much part of the future, and I, I feel very hopeful whenever I see a wind turbine. And I was very, I'm very pleased to see, I'm starting to see letters in the Daily Telegraph and the Times from engineers and others saying the same sorts of things. Uh, David Cameron said in the British Parliament that, um, oh, uh, people don't like wind. But uh, something like 70, 80% of people are now saying when they see a wind turbine, they feel hopeful. Wind turbines are about doing the right thing by Mother Earth and by, the, by one another. Because wind is now the cheapest form of power from scratch, from commissioning to delivery in the United Kingdom, not the most expensive. Um, uh, if we consider also the climate effects of, of, of burning other sorts of fuel. So I'm very hopeful that we will have a country which will be not 80% of, of fossil fuels by 2050, but 100%. And uh, I, th I hope it will be contributing to the net global uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions by producing not 100% of our energy, but 120 or 150% and exporting it down to uh, a possibly by that stage another nation. Um, and I hope we'll all be in the European Union again by then as well, as uh, perhaps uh, separate uh, members. Um, so that's a little bit of my, uh, my hope. Um, but alongside energy, we also need to look at land. Huge areas of Scotland are owned by a very small number of people. Uh, we've never had a revolution in this country, and so we've never had land reform, as almost all of our European neighbours have. I used to live in Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia. All of these countries had land reform after the Second World War, and as a result, they became some of the most successful economies on Earth, because land reform redistributes the assets to the ordinary people and makes the wealth of the nation, we're sitting here in Adam Smith's room, makes the wealth of the nation available to the people. Alongside wind, land is a signal and underutilised asset of this nation of ours. And to address our climate responsibilities, one of the things we have to do is to get an active economy going again, which is sustainable, which creates jobs locally, doesn't rely on huge amounts of shipping and uh, by plane and so on, bringing, for example, 90% of timber products in from around the world. So another of my hopes for the future is, is that we start to build buildings in this country, in Scotland, made of Scottish materials, uh, for example, engineered wood grown on, in Scottish forests. That would, of course, mean that we would need to break up the biggest states. We would need mainly to end, and I would love to see it, um, the use of uh, large areas of upland for sport, for, um, sport by very rich people. Um, and devote that land again to forests, as most upland is devoted in mainland Europe. I've just come back from Vermont. Uh, many Scots went to Vermont and uh, cut the trees down and put sheep on the land. 
They then went west and the trees have grown back. There is now a huge uh, forest industry in Vermont and it's a very important part of the economy of Vermont. So um, I'm also hopeful about the possibility that we will really genuinely reforest Scotland in the, ne in the next 40 years, but we need to do, but we will also need land reform, much more radical than we've had thus far in order to do that. Now, the third area I think that we really need to think about in terms of climate change is our diet. We know that more than a third of uh, greenhouse gas emissions comes from the food economy. We also know that Scotland imports a huge amount of food, and not only from south of the border, from other parts of the world. Um, I, tr I travel perhaps more than is good for the climate, but I do, um, I do, uh, do a lot of research in other countries. And I was recently in South Korea. They've got all kinds of problems, as you know, right now in terms of security. But they are, um, because of the situation they're in between Japan and China, and now Japan, China, and North Korea, they are an incredibly resilient and self-reliant people. And they grow all their own food. A lot of it is grown under tunnels. Now, in South Korea, the tunnels are to protect the food from the heat. As a grower myself here in Scotland, I have a, a, an acre of a vegetable land garden in, um, in the middle of the Buclew estate over on the, in Dumfriesshire. Uh, obviously, the issues here are protecting food from uh, cold, uh, rabbits, pigeons, and various other things that we gardeners have to face up to in the countryside. But it can be done. Uh, I, I therefore also expect that uh, by 2050, we, we, we will look at uh, the environment around our cities uh, completely differently to how we do now, rather more like Ebenezer Howard, imagine the Garden City. And I would love to see the whole of the Central Belt covered in vegetables, in, in vegetable growing and vegetable gardens, uh, in cycle paths between the vegetable gardens and the city, so people at weekends, instead of feeling the need to fly to Prague or something, would get on their bicycles with their children safely, not encountering vehicles on the way, and go out into the gardens that, where the city is producing its own food and teach their children about caring for the earth. It's completely possible, that vision. It's not at all a pipe dream, but it could only happen if we, have, if we reform our land and tax system, uh, and in particular bring back uh, land value tax into this country, we hugely underuse the greatest resource other than wind that I've just already spoken of in this country, in Scotland, and that is land. The Dutch have a great deal less land than we do in Scotland, and far less per person. They're the second largest agricultural exporters in the world. It's absolutely amazing what they do with the land they have. And Scotland could be the largest agricultural exporter in the world. We have five million people on a land area the size of England, and most of it is not used for growing food. Now, you might say to me, oh, but it's, it's difficult land to use. Well, they're polytunnels, they're not terribly beautiful, but they can be made to look better. But if we really devoted ourselves as a nation to becoming self-sufficient in food, in fuel, and in fibre, which, and here the trees are so important, fibre being for clothing, and um, construction, uh, we would, I think, not just have um, got to zero net emissions, we would have created a much more just and sustainable nation filled with jobs for migrants who will need to move to Scotland by 2050 because other parts of the world by then will be uninhabitable. And Scotland's climate actually is going to get better because of climate change. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Sarah Knight. So, hello. Um, when I was preparing for this session, I was sitting in my favourite cafe in Stockbridge having coffee, and I thought about the title, The 2050 Vision, and I thought, it's really hard to imagine a day in my life in 2050. So that's 33 years' time, I'll be 59 years old, sprouting several grey hairs, and probably really worrying about the prospect of working for an extra 30 years because my pension's been ruined. And I was flicking through the news app on my phone, trying to think of ideas, and I thought, well, what might this day exactly as I'm doing look in 2050? Well, first of all, the, my coffee would be a luxury good, because coffee production is going to go down by 88% due to climate change by 2050. And then I thought about the uh, potential headlines that would be coming up on my phone. And I picked out certain headlines which are based on certain projections that are happening just now. So there's been another extreme case of flooding, is headline one. This doesn't come as a shock to me, as this is quite a norm around the world just now. Areas which would have before had a 1% chance of having flooding every 100 years are now having extreme floods every 10 years or so. Headline two, fisheries lose another $10 billion this year. Again, this doesn't come as a shock, as this has been happening every year. 
This is affecting livelihoods, especially in developing countries, and threatening food security. Headline three. The global economy loses more than 3.5% of its GDP. Again, I'm not shocked by this. This has been happening every year for the last 20 years leading up to 2050. And with some countries losing as much as 11% of their GDP. And the last headline, which is one I'm really, really optimistic about, is that Scotland finally wins the Six Nations Rugby. <laughs> so I'm sure I don't have to sit and tell everyone here the potential bad things that are going to be happening in the situation where we don't have any behavioural change and we work as business as usual. On a more civic level, which might affect Scotland quite badly, is there might be a certain level of a fractured society with a lot of blame being put on those who are currently in power in 2050, which is going to be my generation. Although this seems like a very pess pessimistic vision, it is a potential vision that I have if we don't change the way we live just now. And it's action now that we at the 2050 Climate Group, who I'm talking on behalf of today, are working towards achieving. We are a youth-run charity with the aim of engaging, educating and empowering the future leaders in order to develop their skills and take action on climate change now. And one of the key ways we do this is through our Young Leaders Development Programme. So this falls in really well with the theme of today as it's trying to basically carve your way through into making your own 2050 visions become a reality. And through our programme, we're trying to make a social movement. So through um, a series of modules and engagement events, we give our young leaders the skills and knowledge in order to lead their own movements. And this could be just personal changes to their habits or going to their local supermarket to ask for them to change a certain behaviour, approaching a policy maker to ask them to make a more ambitious climate change policies, or in starting up your own business. And the list goes on, but it's essentially about giving them the confidence to do something they may have otherwise felt unable to do, thinking, oh, somebody further up in work will be able to do, or I'm too young to make a big difference. So eventually, our vision is that instead of ambitious climate change action being seen as a bit radical, it's going to be seen as a new norm. And this new normal means something different to everyone, but I see it as Scotland being a fair and very forward thinking and hopefully zero carbon country. And in order to get to these future visions, you have to talk more about the plans and the process of getting there. So if you look up the, the definition of a vision, it's not being able to you know, tell the future. It's more about being able to have the foresight in order to plan for making your own future. So a few weeks ago, before getting told about this talk, I was chatting to my dad. And he's born, he's quite old, he's born in 1937 in Edinburgh during World War II. And I was asking him to describe just the everyday habits of everyone. And he was essentially saying that every single person's behaviour and habits completely changed because of the war effort. So whether you were directly involved in the war, say, um, volunteering or in the local armed forces, or whether you're completely disengaged and not interested at all, your habits had to change in order to survive. And this ranged from trying to grow your own food and being really, really careful with the amount of resources you had, which was also helped through the Dig for Victory movement. And this made me realise that this is probably the level of mobilisation we need in order to fight against climate change. So whether you're interested in the topic or you work in the topic or you don't really care at all, your habits and your actions do need to change and they need to change now. So it does seem quite like a hefty and sometimes quite daunting thought, the level of behavioural change we need today. But it has happened, and it has happened quite recently, quite um, successfully in Scotland. And one example is the 5p plastic charge for plastic bags. This is very simple and very effective, with bag usage going down by 95%. And maybe this might suggest that Scottish people are a little bit stingy, but it also created a very rapid change in the way people saw a consequence of their actions. So whether or not you cared about the amount of plastic in the world, you were forced to change your habits. So climate change rela related behavior, behavioral change, I believe is very achievable. And people in my generation are gonna be in position, positions of power by 2050, so running governments and heads of businesses and things. So we, in order to run a low carbon and sustainable economy and country, we need to have the skills and knowledge now in order to shape that future. So I don't really have much of a vision exactly how Scotland's going to look, but more about how it's going to be run. That every decision made, whether it's governmental, personal or business, 
will have climate change at the forefront of the decision making. So hopefully when I'm 59 and reflecting back on my old favourite cafe in Stockbridge about this talk, I'll be reading through my um, news headlines and seeing more positive headlines, or at least ones not quite so dramatic as I'd read it before. Although I do hope that the one about the rugby does eventually come true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can I thank all of our speakers, um, as well as making thought-provoking contributions? All of these were succinct. MSPs in the room, please note. <laughs> uh, we now move to uh, questions. Um, the questions can be directed at all of the panellists or at individual uh, panellists, as you wish. I'm going to take questions from the floor in a moment, uh, but we're going to start with one of the questions that's been received via Twitter. Victoria. Yep, so this uh, question has come in from Twitter from Thomas McEwen. What should young people's priorities be if they want to positively affect climate change in the future? Sarah, do you wish to kick off? <laughs> um, I suppose just trying to get... I mean, it depends what they mean by priorities um, and this line of work, but I suppose trying to get as much opportunities potentially within this work to try and get on you know, to have more of a decision-based role. So that can be, you know, we encourage people to ask their employers to ask if they can be on the board, for example, or to be included in decision-making um, things. Um, in terms of priorities, I suppose being, well, you can get in touch with our charity and we can tell them all about it. Um, and just, you know, there's loads and loads of opportunities out there and it's very... I see it as like for youth to be engaged in stuff, it's very important to have a really like fun and quite a social kind of network as well with it. So it's probably about seeking out a good support network in order to take actions as well. Uh, Professor Northcott, how important are young people in driving a, re a response to climate change? I, th I think they're very important. I think this is why Michael Gove tried to stop them learning about climate change in school. He, of course, has been working for Rupert Murdoch for many years, and Rupert Murdoch's papers have been spreading the message around the world, especially in the English-speaking world, and they wish to spread it through Sky Television as well, quite soon, I gather, uh, that climate science is a load of rubbish. And so he tried to get it off the curriculum in England and Wales. Why? And the same is happening in the United States. They're privatizing schools in the United States. Uh, in order to stop children being taught to care for the environment, in order to stop children being taught about climate science. So some people have got it, that if you teach children what adults are doing to the earth, it will change things eventually. It's hugely important to teach the next generation, but we have to teach them hopefully. And for example, engage them in the way we run our primary and secondary schools in environmental change in the very buildings in which they're working and living. So if you just teach them bad news and don't give them ways to engage, as, as Sarah's also been saying, then you don't spread hope, you spread fear. And that's the last thing we want to do. We need to say, as I was trying to say in my little talk, that there is an upside to this. We can live better with each other and the Earth. We can join them up. Okay. Mighty Haggis. Yeah, I completely agree with what Michael said. And I think that first priority, I think, is just keep talking about it. Um, talk, 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 talk. Discuss with everybody um, as much as possible. But yeah, absolutely um, love the earth. Find ways in which you can get that sense of pleasure from, from doing the right thing. So acknowledge all those little things that you do every day when you turn down the paper cup and feel good about it. OK, thank you. Uh, we do have a roving mic, so if anyone at the back of the room wishes to ask a question, just indicate. But uh, can I invite the first question from the audience? Gentleman at the back of the room. Uh, hello, uh, Mike Helm from Creative Commons Scotland. I guess that it's kind of been acknowledged by this event, but how important do you think that creative thinkers are in terms of um, bringing climate change to the fore and inspiring people to take action for a sustainable future? Mandy. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've moved through my life from my, you know, I've got a PhD in artificial intelligence and I used to think that there were technological answers to the, to the problems that we face and I reached a conclusion that although there may be technological aspects to the solutions that we need, we ultimately need um, to engage our, our hearts and our souls as well as our minds in um, tackling these problems and I think that it's, it's only through... Um, having the full spectrum of, of society, including the creative end of the spectrum, engaged in these issues that we can really make progress. 
There's a wonderful book by a man called Amitav Ghosh called The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. And he is a novelist, first and foremost, a brilliant novelist. But he wrote this book, uh, and it's a passionate, beautifully written book, uh, because he felt that it was very important for creative people to think about this problem and why we're not we're doing, as he feels, so little about it. Um, so I think uh, it's great when we have... And Ian McEwan wrote a, wrote a novel called Solar a few years ago. Um, I think it's terribly important that all aspects of the culture... Uh, and that includes uh, religious thinkers as well, uh, are engaged on this issue because, of course, um, quite a lot of the difficulty with climate change and with accepting it is cultural. We've been trained two, for two, three hundred years, not least by Adam Smith, to think of the earth as a stable background for making money, for wealth, for jobs, for growth. And what climate science is teaching us is it's not a stable background. It's actually in the mix with us. We are constantly interacting with this, with this planet. And what we do is changing the planet. But this is very counterintuitive because for hundreds of years, the culture has taught us something else. So we do need cultural change and new creative thinking across all disciplines, not only in the natural sciences and in economics and renewable energy to, to think through the implications. And a lot of the resistance, I think, is in the realm of culture. People feel it can't be true because their story of their, most people's lives has been about progress. It's been about fossil fuels, it's been about energy, it's been about economic growth, and it's brought wonderful things to most people on this planet to this point in time. As people think, well, it can't be true that things are going to get worse. Surely they're just going to carry on getting better. We have to imagine, reimagine uh, the way we think about uh, the human project to really cope with climate change science. Okay. Sarah? Nothing much I can add to that. <laughs> uh, John Scott, MSP, has a question for us. John. Uh, thank you, uh, Graham. Um, I'm interested in um, Professor Northcott's vision of central Scotland being covered in vegetable plots and cycle paths. And I have to declare an interest as a farmer. And given that central Scotland is 85% less favoured areas, which, as he will know, is a European designation regarding its ability to produce food, in other words, a less favoured area, uh, what does he see as the practical and cost-efficient route to achieving this, as it assumes that the generation of farmers before, of which I am one, knew absolutely nothing? Well, as you well know, um, farmers have been promised um, European Union um, subsidies um, at the present level until just 2022, um, both here and in England. I was speaking at a, an event um, down in England with a number of farmers on Sunday, including the NFU representatives. And, of course, farmers are all extremely concerned about what's going to happen in 2022. Um, now, from my perspective... Um, <laughs> I have to admit that I, I, as, a, as, a, I'm, as an economics student, as a teenager, I thought that joining Europe was a mistake because of the common agricultural policy. So I was opposed to joining Europe. I'm certainly, not opposed, I'm certainly opposed to leaving it. Now we've completely integrated our economy with Europe for the last 40 years, including our food economy. But the fact of the matter is that reacquiring, as we will do, either in London or Scotland, and I'm hopeful that it will be in Scotland, the power to shape food growing and the landscape uh, more significantly in the future than we can at present, without the mediation of Brussels and the CAP, we will be able to direct subsidies far more effectively, it seems to me, to achieve both food self-sufficiency, or as I like to talk about it, food sovereignty here in Scotland, and uh, reforesting of much more of our upland area, uh, and uh, conservation and preservation of um, sites of uh, very special interest, including aesthetic um, and landscape value. So I, I, I see no real conflict there. Um, quite a lot of the land in Scotland right now, in terms of arable land, is devoted to animal feed and to raising animals. Uh, and I think another part of the issue we may have to face up to is a, a huge amount of current public subsidies, as I understand it, and you may, you probably know more about this than I do, but I, as I understand it, if you look at the, the direction of subsidies right now, quite a lot of them 
uh, go towards animal feed production and animal production, rather less of them go to horticulture. It seems to me that since we now know that the consumption of vegetables and fruit is hugely beneficial to the human population relative to the consumption of uh, meat and dairy products. We could both reduce our health bill, increase biodiversity, uh, and, and increase our self-sufficiency in terms of uh, horticulture by redirecting the subsidy from uh, the animal um, production to, towards vegetable and fruit production. OK. OK. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> quick question, really. Um, Sarah mentioned the 5p bag charge reduced bags by 95%. So what would you consider to be the next 5p bag charge equivalent that should be introduced? Is it deposit return? Is it paying for your to-go coffee cup? I mean, what would you suggest? Maggie, yes, Maggie, yes, tax paper cups, disposable cups, get rid of them. We don't need them. Um, yes, take any measure you can possibly make to get rid of disposable cups, please. <laughs> Whether they're paper or plastic or, or any other material, but we should be reusing um, and there are wonderful schemes, for example, in Germany, where whole cities are coming together to create municipal cup libraries, for want of a better word, so that, that, that people can um, get a reusable cup on the go and then take it back to somewhere else. And, the, and they're just citywide um, pools of, of cups um, circulating. Um, and yeah, it's it, particularly cups because of the coating, paper cups because of the coatings, which make them completely unrecyclable. Um, they're, they're, a, they're a nightmare. And I think people genuinely don't really like them either. They don't like creating all of that waste. So um, it, it's clear that, that, relative, that there are some chains who, sorry, don't get me started on this. I've, I've made the point. Uh, Sarah, uh, there's probably greater resistance being expressed currently to DRS than there perhaps was to the uh, plastic bag charge. How do we overcome that? Um, well, I'm not entirely sure in terms of an answer because, you know, in some way I don't think it should be enforced. Like the 5p bag is absolutely enforced. And things like you're saying about the coffee cups, there are reusable coffee cups and it's become a habit of people my age to use them all the time. Um, but that's not enforced. So I think, you know, it is more of a habit change rather than, you know, spreading the word and spreading the importance of it. Because if you enforce it, people will become a little bit resistant to it. But the plastic bag thing, I suppose, you know, in order to have a reusable coffee cup, you have to then go and spend £10 on it. And to some people, that's just a little bit, you know, at the time seems a bit more expensive. Um, so if there's some way of giving, I don't know, one Tupperware and one free fork and one free cup to every household, then instead of our plastic bins as well. So. Well, they're not made of plastic. <laughs> I support the Scottish Government's stated intention to put a deposit on every bottle sold in this country. I think this is absolutely essential. I often, you know, visit beaches, I love the coast, and very often when I do that, I pick up a plastic bag and I fill the plastic bag with plastic items. And you can fill dozens of them on many of our beaches. And it's a tragedy. We're filling the ocean with plastic and we've got to stop. And the best way to do this is to create value in the product that's being currently thrown away. Um, so you put five or 10 P on every bottle, glass, plastic and tin, and you, you create a resource which is then reused. Everybody's invested in it. It's not a fine in the same way as a plastic bag is a fine but it will encourage recycling of that product and much more than we're seeing at the moment. Thank you. Do you have another question from Twitter? Yeah, it's uh, actually from Facebook from somebody called Jeff W. Justice, and he's asking Maggie Hath Haggith, Mandy Haggith, um, as a writer, how do you feel that climate change will change language itself and the art of language? Wow, what an interesting question. That's a really difficult question. Um, well, at the moment, I, th I think one of the things that is um, quite frightening about the whole climate change debate is the ugliness, ugliness of, of a lot of the language that, that is used. Um, there's an awful lot of nasty, um, long word jargon terms like mitigation and, and stuff and, uh, that are, are kind of off-putting. So I would hope that we'll, we'll move through that to... To a, to a phase where we start inventing um, new and more fun kind of language to get at the, um, 
the feel good side of of making the kind of changes which are making the world better um so yeah that's that's one thing and i guess we're going to need all sorts of um new terms for um the the kind of landscapes that used to be inhabited and become flooded and and so forth so they yeah um I'm not sure that's a very good answer to the question, but interesting question. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Ponder it. OK, can I turn this to the audience? Richard Dixon at the back. <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, I'm from Friends of the Earth, Scotland. Um, we had some very interesting announcements in the programme for government two weeks ago. So some big policies which will make a difference on climate emissions. That's great. A consultation finishes this week on what new climate targets we should set. And that's not so promising, so they're not as ambitious as they should be in terms of the Paris Agreement. Graham Day's committee will have quite a job in strengthening those. But I wanted to ask the panel, from your 2050 seat, what do you want to look back on and remember Scotland for? What was Scotland's contribution to global efforts on climate change? Sarah. Um, I think we're kind of going that way anyway, but for Scotland to be the very first country to make a, a really vast movement in terms of climate change and um, we are leading the way in certain you know policies and the way we live in things so it's maybe to potentially be the first country to get a certain carbon reduction um as you were saying the the new climate change bill isn't necessarily as ambitious as it should be but that doesn't mean we're not necessarily going to achieve more ambitious targets and um, so yeah i see scotland being like one of the first countries to do something fun and really forward thinking <laughs> The UK Climate Change Committee um, has indicated it would be happy with the target that the Scottish Government is setting. Um, what makes you say we need to go further? Is it realistic to go further, Professor? I think it is realistic. Um, but the, the trouble is that when you say the, the word realistic, it means um, money. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the principal areas where emissions uh, are, are emanating from in, in the Scottish economy, uh, it's still um, the housing stock and offices, um, mainly heating. We don't need so much cooling here. Um, it's uh, vehicular transportation, um, livestock. Um, so it does seem to me that we could have... Um, we, we, we could set ourselves um, the target of 100% zero emissions by 2050, and we might be one of the first nations, thinking globally, to achieve that. Um, but we're only going to do that with, I think, with more ambition uh, than perhaps we have shown thus far. But having said that, I do think that the 2010 Act was hugely ambitious. And it was achieved that target in part because so many people from across Scotland came to this parliament and said they wanted a more ambitious act than was originally proposed. And I think so one of Scotland's contributions, I think, is to show that having uh, a devolved parliament and evolving energy and climate policy makes possible a more ambitious target. It shows democracy works when we're talking about care for the earth. I think I so I I think it's realistic. Um, but for me, the great, my, my great concern about the way we, we approach this or have tended to approach this in, in the UK as a whole is that we, we use energy pricing to discourage the use of energy uh, as a way of reducing emissions alongside putting new kinds of energy into the grid and so on. Now, what this does, of course, is to punish the poorest, most of whom are, are living in houses that don't belong to them, and so private landlords, for example, have very few duties to ensure those houses are well insulated because currently we don't impose those sorts of duties significantly on private landlords. At least that's my understanding up to now. And so I think that um, we need urgently, I think, to address uh, the state of the nation's housing stock um, more rapidly than even we have been doing thus far. And that would link what I think is another part of Scotland's contribution to the global ethics of climate change, which is climate justice. Uh, and reducing emissions. If, we, if, if the way we go about um, pricing energy forces people in the poorest communities to make choices every day between heating their houses and going out and buying food, then we haven't got climate justice in Scotland. But Sarah, 
uh, referenced earlier the, the possibility that asking people to purchase a reusable coffee cup might be problematic. If one accepts that, wouldn't there be far greater resistance if one of the measures required to achieve uh, the ambitions that Friends of the Earth are looking for around the missions was that everyone had to replace their central heat and boilers, for example? Well, it seems to me that most homeowners, um, given the right kind of um, access to finance uh, and having equity in their homes, won't find that difficult. So therefore, I don't think that is a huge problem. Low-income people do not buy boilers. Uh, they have boilers bought for them, and they're normally extremely inefficient because they're heating inefficiently, inefficient building stock. So I, I don't think that the boiler change issue is really a, a justice issue. I think, it's, I, I think the problem is how we regulate the housing stock, and particularly the rental housing stock in Scotland. Okay. Mandy. Yeah, I'm, I really um, agree with a lot of what Michael said about um, climate justice. I think Scotland, we need to look back on, on a Scotland which treated climate change not just as an environmental issue, but also a social and an economic issue. And um, in, in the, and, you know, become the first country that really demonstrates that um, climate friendly energy production is an economic boon to the to the country and and manage it in that way and also that um, the the social justice issues not only within our own society but also globally um, are, are taken into account the the people who are um, adversely affected whether they're on low-lying islands or in the Sundarbans being <coughs> flooded or whether they're up in the Arctic um, that that we at some level take responsibility for the historical um, impact of of our emissions over the past, um, well, since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and, um, and I think also it would be great if, if people could look back and kind of said, OK, there was a generation there who understood the concept of resilience and actively tried to manage society to, to be um, more resilient in, in the face of the changes which are inevitable and help the rest of the world to also be resilient in that, in that way. I think that's, we can do a lot in terms of thinking only about mitigation measures, but, but Ultimately, there are millions, billions of people in the world for whom um, the historical impact of the emissions that we've already put out are going to cause and are already causing um, disasters which we need to take responsibility for and, and help um, other people to become resilient. So. OK, thank you. Victoria. Uh, yep, yeah, we've got another question from Twitter from Jerry McGee. Can Scotland operate in the oil and gas sector and still do our bit for climate change? Good question. Sarah. Um, well, I'll also be careful what I say because this is obviously going on Facebook. But um, so from people that I've spoken to in the oil and gas industry, obviously they want to. It's a lot of people's jobs, a lot of people's livelihood. And it does bring in a lot of money for Scotland. But I don't think it's about running oil companies as they are. It's about making them an oil energy or, um, company. Because just now it's the oil and renewables are separate, whereas they should come together because there's lots of transferable skills. Engineers who go down the rigs can easily go down the rigs and wind farms and things as well. So it's about not going against them, but allowing these companies, because there is a lot of money there which we could utilise for our benefit, really, for renewable energy. So you see a sort of transition period moving an, away yeah, from oil and to gas? Yeah, to an oil to, energy, to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Professor? Well, I have to confess that um, my father worked for Shell for many years and they paid my school fees. I always feel I need to own, that, own up to that in public um, on the, when I'm talking about climate change. Um, so I know a little bit from the inside about the oil and gas industry. Um, and, of course, one, one thing I did, do remember very clearly from... Um, conversations around the family uh, dining table uh, about oil is the price of oil and the close relationship between the price of oil and the viability of any oil fields. Um, now, the marginal cost, so that's the cost of getting a barrel of oil out of the ground in Saudi Arabia, I'm told, is about $5. The marginal cost of getting a barrel of oil out of the North Sea, even uh, in terms of the... Um, 
the infrastructure needed to, do, to achieve that, and the energy as well, the energy cost, is over $50. So currently, as we all know, there isn't a huge case for um, new exploration uh, in the North Sea. Uh, and that is a, a, a sad thing for the northeast of, of Scotland because the economy of the northeast of Scotland is hugely dependent on our industry. But the northeast of Scotland is changing and will continue to change. Uh, I, I don't, you know, and the other issue, it seems to me, is that there is a problem with economies which become over-dependent on one resource, one primary commodity. And there is an argument that Scotland's economy has up to now been rather skewed by being quite dependent upon oil and gas. It was very notable um, that the uh, famous white paper, uh, it, which made the case for um, independence before the Scottish referendum, a huge part of the case was based upon uh, the oil and gas industry and that resource. Uh, and of course, Alex Salmond is himself, a, 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 I believe, a, a, has something of a background in, in oil economics. So, uh, but I don't think that's I don't think that's the future of Scotland. As I said to you already, I think that the the, 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 the most valuable assets of Scotland are its people, its land, its wind, its coastline, its beauty, um, uh, its its an, an, it, the brilliant ideas and creativity of this nation, and its democracy and its commitment to social justice. And I actually don't think oil and gas is the future of Scotland. I think it's the past. Now, I, that's a controversial view, but that is my view. If we just take the easy oil that's left on the planet, and much of that is in Saudi Arabia, and there's quite a lot still in Iraq, if we just take out the easy oil, we're still looking at two, three degrees of climate change. So why would we want to go after the difficult, difficult oil? And Saudi Arabia is pumping fast because it knows that in the future the oil price will be devalued by the whole issue of the unburnability of oil, which, of course, Mark Carney here in the United Kingdom has already highlighted as a problem for the UK stock exchange. So I'm afraid I think that the oil and gas industry will continue to decline, particularly if the Saudis keep pumping as they are, which then they show you no sign of changing that. Mandy. No. OK, shot, shot. Keep it in the ground. <laughs> okay, thank Quit you your that. job and go and work on renewables. <laughs> okay, Victoria, any other questions from? Uh, yes, so from Alan Clark, uh, food buying needs to change. No, no more strawberries from Argentina in December. Why is this encouraged rather than discouraged? Mandy, do you want to go first? Yes, and I'm looking very guiltily at the piece of watermelon on my plate. <laughs> <clears throat> very good point, I agree. 